Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Paul Bridges, Chair of the Communities in Bloom Foundation. I'd like to welcome you all to our third webinar of the 2020 Special Edition season. Uh, today, we'll be hearing from experts on landscape and floral displays. Uh, today's webinar is for our registered communities, and I understand we have four countries participating today with 22 communities. So welcome and thank you so much. And thank you for your support of our 2020 program. Next week, we'll be hosting a second webinar, which will be offered to all Canadian and international communities and registered communities uh, to join in. So please feel free to come back and, and see us again. In August, we'll be hosting two additional webinars on some of our other judging criteria, and we hope you can participate then as well. We'd like to thank all of our Communities in Bloom sponsors and partners at this time for their contribution uh, in our 2020 special edition. Their support and the support of registered communities is truly appreciated. Bear with me for one second, and our tech department is bringing up our list of sponsors just again we'd really want to be sure that they understand how important they are and how important you as our community participants are hopefully Dave can there we go <laughs> thank you everyone we're all uh, I am not a computer specialist so our tech department has been bearing with me trying to get me through the learning curve of getting us all uh, up to speed in our new digital world um, Today, we're going to be welcoming two of our CIB judges, uh, Bob Iveson and Tina Liu, and they'll both be providing advice and answering questions about landscape and floral displays. Please feel free to ask your questions in the question answer feature throughout this presentation, and we'll do our best to address them all. Uh, you can find the question and answer feature on the bottom of your screen, and if you don't see it, um, hover your mouse around the bottom of the screen, it will tend to pop up. So we'll try and be sure that we can um, get through your questions as possible today. Curious, Dave in the background. Again, I would just like to make sure our sponsors are recognized. And sorry folks about the small uh, glitch. If not, I'll be sure at the very end, uh, we'll, we'll pop back to that again to let everyone take a note. So. Um, at this type stage, I'd like to introduce our first of our two speakers today, Bob Iveson. Bob has had a career in horticulture for over 50 years, and over that time, he's gained a vast amount of experience and knowledge, and he's happy to share that knowledge through the CIB program. Bob started his horticultural career with the Royal Parks London, followed by study at the Royal Botanical Gardens at Kew. He then worked for various local authorities in and around London, culminating as the head of service position for the London Borough of Enfield. His last 15 years, he formed his own company providing strategic and management support uh, to park services and other government agencies. Now retired, he still uh, has active involvement in many horticultural related programs, and today Bob will be focusing on landscapes. Thank you, Bob, and welcome. Thank you very much, Paul. If I can just share my screen. Okay. Well, good evening to everybody from the UK. It is evening here. I know it's uh, slightly different with you, but uh, it is evening with us. So I'm going to be uh, running through the criteria and showing a few images to illustrate the categories. Some of the images you may not exactly uh, recognize but really are there to make you think a little bit more. Next week, I will be showing a lot more of the outstanding uh, community examples that I've seen on my uh, judging tours. And then you can also see what can actually be achieved when all the community work together. So, landscape, is a challenging uh, and probably the most challenging category within the Community in Bloom calendar. And you will see that the rewards you get for the uh, landscaping are actually reflected in that. In fact, there are 200 points available. Uh, so take care when planning the tour to ensure that all the bases are covered. Now, landscaping includes the planning, design, construction, and maintenance of parks and open spaces uh, that are uh, in, suitable for the intended use and the location uh, on an all year round basis. 
elements for inclusion uh, are native and introduced materials uh, with the balance of plants, materials and constructed elements. Appropriate integration of hard surfaces and art elements use the use of turf and ground covers. Landscape design should harmonize the interest of all sectors of the community. Standards of execution and maintenance should be demonstrate, should demonstrate good practice, including quality of naturalization, use of ground covers and wildflowers, along with turf management. As always, the evaluation is separated into municipal, business and institutions, residential and community involvement. So what does all this mean? You could consider that this is not just the landscape, but consider it as the cityscape or the townscape. Judges will be looking at how the natural and built infrastructure is blended together to make the town or your city a better place to live and how it improves the quality of lives of the community. Judges will be taking into account how it's all integrated with the other sections of the evaluations particularly floral displays, urban forestry, tidiness and environmental action. So let's look at the various elements. For municipal, we, you have gateway impressions, sustainable designs, landscape plan, turf management programs, landscape maintenance, landscape quality and qualified resources. And then of course the all year round appeal. Taking them individually, I will look at uh, these examples. Municipal gateway, the gateway impressions. First impressions of the community include the gateway, the entrances, treatment. Uh, this is a place, is it a place that is welcoming and appealing? Is it a place that you'd want to stop at? In this example, it's a fairly simple uh, use of grasses, turfed around the outside, nice colorful sign with a good backdrop of, uh, of trees. But then if you move on to sustainable designs, the soft landscape aspect, what we're looking for here is the sustainable design, which is seasonally adjusted. So your summer bedding, your, your spring bedding and such like. Energy efficient use, as uh, particularly water, uh, use of green materials, naturalization, zero escaping, oops, excuse me. Zeriscate considerable plant varieties, including pollinator friendly, traffic calming and bank stabilization. Here you've got the use of the poppies and wildflower mixes adjacent to what is a community garden. And then on the right hand side, it's a traffic calming measure uh, related to the introduction of cycleways. Hard landscaping. This is the urban and civic design standards for streetscape. Uh, of public places. Flags, banners, public art, fountains and site furnishings, signage, seasonal designs and decor walkways and paving materials. In this instance here, this is in Seoul in South Korea, where we have what is ostensibly a simple waterway. In fact, this was a covered river uh, with houses on the top. Uh, the community decided that that was not the best way uh, to uh, have a sustainable water system. So the houses were demolished, the cover was taken off the river, they created a walkway, embankments, tree planting, there are splash parks, fitness parks, uh, and other entertainment spaces all the way along it. Fantastic achievement. So a landscape plan uh, is another aspect. This is the integrated implemented throughout the municipality. Communities may have a city or town master plan that zones the areas for residential, business and retail, etc. Judges will be asking whether there is a landscape plan to go alongside the master plan to determine how the natural, green and built environments are integrated. This will give you an overall impression as to how the community is approaching its city or townscape. Now some smaller communities may not have a written plan. So through conversation, judges will be assessing how the community has evolved and intends to go forward. Turf management programs. Here we're looking for the integration of pest management, plant health care, alternative solu solutions to disease and infestations, and when appropriate, 
increased naturalization and adopted maintenance programs. Landscape maintenance. Does the community have policies, standards and best practices and programs that set the standards to be achieved across the city? They may not be a single standard, but variable ones depending on location, but they are all planned. And it's the same with landscape quality. The landscape maintained to appropriate standards, specifications and best practices. Qualified resources. Now we're looking for qualified personnel, included the seasonal staff and or in place of training programs and qualified experienced contractors. Equipment needs to be well maintained and appropriate for the task. And year round usage, demonstrate year round opportunities and programs for education and use of parks and open spaces, urban agriculture, community gardens, parks and recreation programs. Here you have Churchill Square in Edmonton, used as a water feature during the summer, kids play in Splash Park during the winter, it's used for ice skating. And then at other times you have the community events and programs that therefore entertainment and social interaction. Moving on to business and institutions, you have sustainable designs, integrated plan and maintenance quality as the three sections. Now sustainable designs, uh, looking for energy efficient use of green materials, naturalization, xeriscaping, alternative ground covers and urban agriculture. In this instance here, this is in Edmonton, the building is to Leeds Platinum Standards. Uh, it's a workshop and design centre, but also includes a, uh, a restaurant and outside they grow their own vegetables and herbs for inclusion in the kitchen. Uh, a, a rather uh, excellent example. An integrated plan. Uh, this is a contribution to urban and civic design and public green spaces above requirements, such as public art, streetscape, site furniture, fountains, and innovation in concept and design. In this instance in Coquitlam, uh, it's the rapid transit uh, skyway from um, Vancouver Metro into Coquitlam. Each of the stations is similarly designed. The landscaping is uh, comparable to the city uh, inst included materials and it provides a consistency all the way through the network. Maintenance quality. Adequate ongoing life cycle management, ongoing maintenance, ground and asset management, rehabilitation and replacement of all the landscape elements. Here in, in, uh, in uh, Kamloops, the university, uh, the programs that they have in place there for replacement, maintenance are, are all excellent. And then moving on to residential, looking at streetscape appeal, maintenance quality and plant selections. Now here's one that uh, not quite perhaps as one was expecting. Uh, in a community program, what we're looking for is uh, urban agriculture, community gardens, yard of the week, volunteer parks, maintenance, um, and all year round appeal. This one makes you stop and think and uh, wonder why he's done this. And it's really to start a conversation. It's a marvelous example of some innovative uh, inclusions. But here, if you come back to the standard of maintenance quality with lawns, trees, and shrubs with demonstrated results. And then plant selection. Selection of plant materials, native, local, innovative, edible, pollinator friendly plants. In this particular instance, we are a seaside town on the south coast of England. And what the person has, has done there is used the selection of native and local plants, put them into the garden. They're all pollinator friendly. And again, it starts a conversation. How many people have a little model sailing boat and life belt in their front yard? Not many, I suspect, but a good example. 
and then community involvement. We're looking at public participation and volunteer recognition. Now, public uh, participation can involve the use of uh, the scouts, guides, brownies, service clubs, environmental groups. In this instance, we have a group of youngsters in an environmental work party who are out every Saturday to do their little piece for the community. An excellent example. And then volunteer recognition. It could be the recognition of someone who just sort of got a fantastic uh, front yard in this particular instance, or it could be the whole community where they're brought together to be able to be recognized, to celebrate, to network, and to spread the work of uh, a good community activity. So that runs down through the criteria for landscaping. It, uh, a quick run through, next week we will have a lot more uh, examples of outstanding community achievements. And, uh, but from an evaluation point of view, this is what the judges will be looking for. So thank you very much. And I think we now run through to uh, question and answers, I believe. So I will look at the, at the bottom of our screen here. We've got one question that's come forward, Bob. Uh, this is from John uh, Lowhouse, who is on our Communities in Bloom board. And John has uh, said, the Korean example, which converted an underground stream to an open or recovered greenscapes, uh, seems to be a recent trend. Lexington, Kentucky is doing something similar. Could these conversations, sorry, could these conversions also have benefits in that it lowers the expense of engineered pipe capacity for handling stormwater runoff? And does the landscape category recognize these type of conversions or is it under environmental? I think it's part of both. It's primarily environmental, environmental action, but equally the results are what becomes the overall landscape of that particular city or community. And therefore we will be looking at it as part of the landscape. It will also, it, it will probably, depending on the quality of uh, construction and maintenance, will score highly but I suspect that within the environmental action categories, it would also score very highly too. Excellent. Tina, as a landscape architect, um, would you have an answer to that question? You're on mute at the moment. Here we go. Yeah. Um, yes, it definitely uh, has a benefit to, um, to the uh, wildlife and, uh, and the quality of living of the people around it. Um, <clears throat> so it, it would, I, I think it would be a bit of both. I agree with Bob. Um, environmentally, it, it's, it's beneficial to the community and um, in, in, in landscape uh, point of view, um, it's also um, bring more opportunity to people in terms of recreation and, and the use of green space. Excellent, thank you. And John's following up with an additional question here, uh, say, asking if it would also have value in that hard surface areas, uh, instead of hard surface areas, a city would add green, uh, green plants, life and CO2 impacts. So being on the Green Cities Foundation, as well as the Communities in Bloom Foundation myself, uh, that's exactly something we're starting to quantify and qualify with cities to explain to them the value moving forward of green infrastructure versus gray infrastructure and the sustainability factor and working on uh, some metrics right now to show municipalities that it actually is more economical to build green infrastructure than it is for gray. I, I would agree. There, there was a, a, a great movement here a few years ago, which was uh, uh, from grey to green. And uh, a lot of the uh, programmes associated with it, not just opening up watercourses uh, and culverts, but also looking at the hard spaces between the buildings. Um, slope is, is uh, a word that goes, it's spaces left over after uh, <laughs> development. And uh, greening those up, softening them, make them more environmentally attractive and friendly and usable by the community. Excellent. Uh, we have a question that's coming from Colleen McGregor. Um, she's saying she, they're a small town of 7,000 people on the shores of Lake Huron uh, here in Ontario. Our shoreline is under pressure uh, because of high water levels. 
what would be our best first step to landscape this area after armor stone is put in place to protect the shoreline? Well, it, what I would first of all be doing is, is looking at what the other plants and species that are growing well around Lake Huron in that particular vicinity and concentrated on those to then renaturalize the space. You can then look at the surfaces that you use for access. Uh, what sort of walkways are going to be? What sort of usage will it receive? Is it going to be wheelchair friendly? Uh, is it going to be for bridleways? Is it pedestrians? Um, looking at a surface that is most appropriate to cater for all of those, or indeed separate spaces, separate uh, walkways or separate access ways. Uh, there's no need for totally integration. It just depends on, on what is going to be the best for that particular location and the demands that it's going to receive. Yeah, and, and I think uh, for landscape, it's also, it could be a functional landscape that uh, it can combine uh, with the stormwater management in the area. And then I think that if the municipality is looking or maybe around liquor and there may be a historical municipality would be looking at it together. Um, and, um, and then to have it, uh, because the water level is going to be rising because of the climate change and we have done, we have putting um, study and have do a lot of different things uh, in, in order to adapt to these changes in the climate. Um, and uh, the sh shoreline management, um, it's definitely um, um, uh, a pretty hot topic right now. And I think around Ontario and, and generally in Canada, uh, as we see the, the water level rising. Um, and um, dealing with flood issues and, and um, what my, my personal experience is uh, with, with, the, um, uh, with the flooding along the Ottawa River and, and with the, uh, the um, where I work as uh, National Capital Commissions, we have been uh, establishing the, the shoreline, pretty much re reconstruct some part of it so that it would stay strong and, and, um, and also uh, looking into conserving the wetland area, the natural area that's around these, um, uh, the shorelines were supposed to uh, help out and soften the, 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 uh, the landscape and also taking into the, the extra amount of water when it, during rain event or flood events. Um, and um, we're probably looking into environmental, um, uh, it, this is a part of environmental engineering as well. And uh, um, so it, it would also be a combined effort with the, with the environmental uh, side of the, uh, of the municipality to work on this. Great. Thank you, Tina. Um, as a, I'm a practicing landscape architect as well, and that is a big focus of work we're seeing more with the uh, Great Lakes water level rise. So yeah, definitely looking at different options on best uses, as Bob mentioned, how do we protect the shoreline without, you know, creating a seawall, which limits habitat so therefore trying to bring in you know, plantings as one alternative uh, and really, as, as Tina mentioned, also protect the naturalized areas and wetlands that are in place um, to help slow down some of this uh, degradation. So um, John Luhaus has an additional question here. And then after that, I believe, I think we'll move over to uh, Tina's presentation. But John has asked, um, from a judging perspective, do judges differentiate between how floral uh, beds invest in perennials versus annuals. Uh, concern with the fact that perennials are harder to time for color, uh, but then annuals are more expensive. What, what would a judge's uh, recommendation be versus, uh, you know, perennials versus annuals? That's a, a great environmental question as well. I, sorry, I, from my perspective, I, I think it, it's really for the community to determine how it wants to go forward and weigh up the options, the priorities that that particular community might have is for a, a great show, in which case you then looking at annuals. They then have to take account of the fact that if they do do that, then there is a cost to it, an environmental cost in a way, uh, with watering, maintenance, management and so on. If you then swing to the perennial, as John just indicated, you haven't quite got the same colour band that you can work with as you would with annuals, but it, but then the benefit is 
it's low maintenance, it's uh, energy uh, efficient, and therefore you've got to wait. So, but it may be that the community will have both working within the community. You'll have some areas where you do want a bit of color and you want to reduce your revenue implications, but there will be instances where you want a splash of color because you want to focus attention to that particular area. Uh, so I think this is where the, the management uh, and landscape plan comes into play. What do you want and where, and what are you for, uh, prepared to pay for? Yeah, I completely agree with Bob. Um, for, for the more uh, key area that if it is, is like a, um, a major intersection and we, you wanted to have uh, more colors and with, with the, um, if you want to like all season, like what we've been doing, that's why we have um, uh, recommended to have the different type of plantings. Like in the springtime, you have like spring bulbs, and then you change into annuals, and 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 that would give you a more uh, more colors. Um, and uh, maybe this would be in the major roadway or in your uh, the entrance of the uh, of the community or town or city. And um, for the, I think it would be a combination of, of all the different type of bats. Um, we've also seen some really successful landscaping with a, a perennial bed and trees and shrubs. And you look at it as a whole, instead of um, having just the bed um, 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 isolating out. And because if you look at the, the entire environment and, and it would actually give you more a picturistic um, uh, uh, view of, of what you're trying to create um, with the uh, with the an perennial bed you can also have little pockets of annual pockets so that you have a bunch of colors throughout the season and then in, in, in at the different timing of the year the perennial would still have their own show and and, and in winter time some of the perennial um, it's a different maintenance schedule for, for annual and perennial. So you would have to have your, the horticulturist or the maintenance team would have to have that knowledge to when to, uh, you know, for annual pretty much watering and weeding, but for um, uh, for the perennial would be when to cut certain plants and that heading certain plants so that to promote more growth. Um, but all in all, I think, I think that's why we uh, try to promote that to have all different types of planting. Uh, to kind of give it uh, your floral program a, a punch of, you know, you would have a four, all, all season display. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tina. So with that, I am going to uh, move along to Tina's presentation today, and I'd like to formally introduce Tina. Uh, Tina Liu has practiced landscape architecture for 25 years in a diverse range of projects internationally. She joined the National Capital Commission in 2010 as design manager of the Capital Floral Program. She leads the design of year-round floral displays in, in Canada's capital, uh, which includes the Canadian Tool Festival in the spring, annual and perennial displays uh, from summer th through fall. This highly these highly visible portfolios allow Tina to exercise her creativity and expertise in landscape design. Tina has been exploring different design approaches to create innovative displays, as well as enhancing pollinator and wildlife habitat while adapting to our constantly changing climate patterns. Tina enjoys sharing her passion and experience by presenting to horticultural societies and interest groups. She is often found volunteering as a horticultural guide, a jury in community gardening contests, or a school council member creating outdoor learning spaces for children. Tina, thank you so much for spending your time with us today. I look forward to your presentation. Thank you. So here I'm going to focus more on the floral display and um, uh, depending on, the, uh, according to our, um, our, judge, uh, our judging criteria, um, floral displays evaluate efforts of the municipalities, uh, businesses and institutions, um, residents uh, to design, plan, execute and maintain floral displays of high quality standards. Um, evaluation includes uh, the design and arrangement of flowers and plants, um, annual, perennial, bulbs, ornamental grasses, edible plants, water efficient and pollinator friendly plants. In the context of originality, uh, distribution, location, 
diversity and balance, color and harmony. This pertains to flower beds, carpet bedding, containers, baskets and window boxes. So um, as, a, as a first impression and if some, when someone enters the town and if you have a, a town sign that would have uh, sitting on the bed of beautiful flowers, it instantly catch people's attention and make people more curious, wanted to learn more about the place. And it also is an opportunity to show um, uh, your identity or um, like an example in here, um, um, Shadiak, it's, a, it's an Arcadian uh, uh, community. So you see that the Arcadian flag, which, which is, it, it's, it's very interesting. It shows your heritage uh, at the same time. And here in Barrie, it's um, with a, a mix of perennial and annual and in, in their bed. So it's, it's, uh, it's um, so reduce some part of the maintenance uh, of um, uh, of the beds because a lot of the time these beds are like right out on the highway and um, this is how uh, we can help you to reduce some part of the the, the maintenance and just um, focus on the the annual and most of the most of the growing season and for um, the municipal um, uh, area that like it our cr uh, criteria judging criteria um, including the plan of action uh, diversity of displays, uh, diversity of plants, um, maintenance quality and qualified uh, resources. Um, so for plan of action, um, integration into overall landscape plan and distribution throughout the community, um, concept and design, including sustainable design. Uh, this is what we look at when the judges look at when we come, uh, come to the, the community. Um, um, so this map on the left that you see that they have um, a map out the, the green corridors and where are the uh, different types of poll pollinators and also um, the diverse habitat garden um, is a promotion that, that they show um, that people not just the municipal land but also uh, um, in res uh, residential and commercial and what they can do um, and what type of habitat that they can provide. Um, this is more on a sustainable design. <coughs> or uh, how for uh, community involvement it, for the plan of action is how do you get the words out and also environmental awareness, how do you get the communities and, and everyone's on the same page and they are also doing the same thing as you do um, um, to share your municipal landscape plan and, um, and also uh, have posters. There are some, some of these are posters from uh, municipalities and also some are from school um, uh, school poster contests, namely showing that you know how uh, it's educational and 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 also we actually get get more people to involve <clears throat> and diversity of displays, uh, including flower beds, raised beds, planters, uh, hanging baskets, window boxes, carpet bedding, and mosaics. And so here are just the uh, example of uh, the different type of displays. Um, so uh, traditional flower beds and also the, the raised bed, uh, the one that you see here is also uh, the raised bed on the left, uh, lower left corner. Um, it's the uh, planting bed with uh, the Elisamikia is perennial, it stays there. And the, uh, the bulbs, uh, the, the um, tulips would change into annuals and then um, over the season and then there are the different types of um, floral display that you can you can play with uh, with baskets and uh, planters big planters small planter combinations of planters and window boxes as well and the diversity of plants so we talk about the annuals the perennials uh, bulbs and a mix of different bulbs uh, for summer uh, for the springtime and then you would change to annuals and then the perennials kind of come up um, behind like when the, the bulbs are done and um, and uh, ornamental grasses and also the uh, pollinator friendly plants in here is showing a, a hydrangea that has um, it has a ton of uh, bees on it and um, <clears throat> For as for municipal maintenance quality, then we talked about that. We, uh, Bob has talked about that in the uh, in the landscape section. So, um, 
in, in a floor display, a uh, very importantly is the, the, the watering, the fertilizing, um, the weeding and um, uh, a dead heading and, and all that. So uh, to maintain um, a clean edge, so you would see that it's a, a it's a very a different impression. So when people come in and they see that everything is clean and neat and and uh, it has its own style and and it um, and also uh, waste management of you know what what the weed what to compost and what not and these also is part of the I think is as part of the municipal responsibility kind of to to tell the community what they can they can make their own compost and uh, but they can also green. Um, uh, uh, make their the the, uh, the green bins and how what they can they should recycle what what not. Um, for qualified uh, resources, so uh, with within a municipality, uh, some of the bigger municipalities, uh, they would have hired their own contractors or they have their own um, um, employees or their own department to do that. And and we we also know that some of the uh, smaller community. Uh, would have volunteers and and but we have to make sure that they all get the uh, a training uh, for safety and also for um uh for uh, what plans that you know what 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 is weed and then what how do you how should you maintain your your yard and and the planting bed and the flower beds um, um so i think not just for the uh employees or the um uh, the contractors that have their own training. And then I think if there are so smaller community that would have their own uh, volunteer, they should have involved volunteer uh, training sessions um, regularly uh, hosted as well. So now going to the business and institution uh, for floor display. And um, so we look at the design concept, uh, overall plan and also maintenance quality. And um, so the design concept and um, it's including uh, arrangement, diversity, color of display and plans on grounds uh, for, for business. And so we've seen a lot of the uh, uh, smaller towns or bigger towns such as in Toronto, they have uh, different areas that they have different BIA um, that they, most of the time they, they it's these, um, this type of organization would, 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 uh, uh, would handle this type of uh, uh, having a plan or a theme of the year so that the uh, Main Street um, business on Main Street can, you know, showcase the town and if it, you know, be, be, became a, uh, a main attraction um, of the town. So um, in springtime, there are different types. This is actually in, in Michigan, uh, but the, the toilet flowers here. Um, and Michigan, um, this is uh, uh, Holland in Michigan is uh, they're doing their tulip time. So they are very big on their tulips. So also their, their heritage is a lot of uh, Dutch uh, immigrants in there. And um, so in the summertime would be the uh, floral display would be the planters. And, and this picture shows everything that they can do. They do it in here. Um, and it, it kind of combined with the uh, infrastructures, um, receptacles and, and benches and stuff like that. Um, you know, hanging basket on the on the light post and um, and also um, on the wall and uh, planters, combination of planters. And on the right hand side, this is the Michigan Avenue in uh, in uh, Chicago. Um, so all this. Uh, shops and the businesses, they actually adopt the section in front of their store. So they do their own display. And this is a fall display that I found it really interesting. Um, they're using uh, grass and also the fall colors, a lot of moms um, trying to create and they, they, it's, it's like a wedding dress store. Right? So then they, it's something that kind of tie into the theme of it and it's make it really interesting. And they, they have contests every year. Uh, summer and fall and, and winter. So also have winter display. So it's, it's something that is can bring the community together and and do something that it's as uh, everyone enjoys to see and and, and this is this uh, uh, Christmas winter bo uh, window box and uh, so it, this could be uh, all season um, when you think of a, a, a floral program and um, for the Business and 
institutions is the overall plan is to to work with the integrate with the the uh the landscape plan and then the overall community floral program say you know you map out the area that where you have the nice trees and uh nice streetscape and we, we wanted to build that uh into the their patio areas and uh, this picture on the top is in yamath um it's a very nice coastal town um so there were all the uh, the um, uh, the street lights have uh, have you know um, uh, hanging baskets and um, and also they they also have uh, um, intersections that they would have some landscaping integrated into the infrastructure as well, which is very nicely done. Um, and um, a patio area with planting, and you you can differentiate the space and also. Uh, dress it up and uh, and just is make the uh, area more welcoming. And this one is uh, in Orangeville. Um, it is the one on the left. The secret garden is actually in front of a library that was uh, maintained. The display is maintained by um, uh, volunteers and the local garden club and the horticultural society. And um, and some of the business that were part of the Communities in Bloom program, and they were uh, offering a green uh, uh, greenhouse space uh, training, and which is really great. Uh, we've seen a lot of smaller community have this type of really uh, really good business that were were very involved in it, and which make the program uh, more successful. And, and under here, it's a, it's, um, a, a college that has uh, offered horticultural programs. So their student would be uh, volunteering for Communities in Bloom, um, which is also uh, part, can, can be a part of the program as well. Um, as for maintenance quality with planting, um, the watering, uh, weeding, edging, deadheading, um, to, to demonstrate with demonstrated results is you know we all know that you know with with gardeners and they always have to water and weed if you want to keep something to keep your plants looking right nice um so these are the business and this is uh in wabamum in alberta with the uh it's, it's a local museum um and but the local garden club uh it's the Communities in Bloom organization also uh, is helping uh, with the landscaping all throughout the town, which is really interesting as well. Um, and this is in Spring Hill, and um, they also have their own, uh, some of the more key area or gardens that they would have their group of, it's called uh, Friends of the Garden or uh, uh, that would have another group of volunteers. And so I think the, the most important thing is to have all the groups that work together. Um, and um, for the residential, it's one of my favorite picture. <laughs> this one is a, a residential, a home, um, grandma and grandpa's place. Uh, it's uh, it's in Wabamum as well. It's a very small town, but it, it's a, it's a very friendly, nice town that um, everyone loves flowers, just like a lot of the Canadian towns. Uh, with the concept and design and maintenance quality as well. So for residential, uh, including the concept and design, including uh, arrangement, diversity, colors of displays and plants, uh, on residential properties, including pollinator gardens and or inclusion of pollinator plants and gardens. So this picture here is showing, I'm oh, sorry. So um, this is a more traditional uh, garden that have um, all the all the plants. This is mostly perennials and they have their own place. And then with the annuals are like in the hanging baskets. And this one is more uh, of a wild garden, but in an English garden kind of feel. And but it also it's a mix of annual and perennial, and uh, it has a slightly different type of maintenance, I would say. But um, uh, if you keep the ground full of you know flowers of plants that is is uh, you uh, that you planted, um, the density is full enough and. So you kind of, the unwanted plant cannot outcompete with the area and it's another way to uh, 
uh, avoiding wheat. And uh, concept and design, these are some of the my, my favorite places that I've been to. And um, the residents really have very personalized space, but uh, is very, very interesting. Uh, maintenance quality, um, it's a homeowner. Um, so uh, uh, watering regularly, uh, having the right tool, edging, um, uh, putting mulch on and constant weeding and uh, or choose, you know, uh, your uh, choice of soil. And it's also important for uh, discourage weed growth and, and, you know, there are other ways of, you know, putting on mulch um, or using compost uh, uh, mulch. So it's, it's partially compost and then you, the next year you can apply more. Uh, that also discourage weed growth and uh, dead heading or you, you can, uh, for areas that um, if say some of the um, uh, Horticultural Society or Garden Club, local cl garden club is helping out with the uh, volunteering for, for the pu uh, public space. Um, the choice of plants are very important if you try to, if, if depending on the maintenance level really, um, if you don't have a lot of manpower to do it, maybe choose the plants that are more self-cleaning instead of having to spend the time to dead head. Um, and uh, self-cleaning meaning when it, the flower dries up after blooming, it just blows away. Um, and um, other than geranium, there are different types of geranium now that are, uh, um, are, are, are also self-cleaning. So um, I'm going to talk more about that in our next webinar. Um, community involvement, uh, public participation, and uh, community support. Um, in uh, public particip participation in uh, community projects, volunteer initiative, including children, youth, and uh, outreach programs in floor display, including promotion and organization, etc. So um, the one on the left, it's a picture from um, Boise of A. Moulton. It's in Alberta. It's a small town. Um, who has been, they have been in, in the um, CIB family for, uh, I think, 25 years. And uh, these are the group of students that they go out to a uh, nursing home to plant flowers for them uh, outside of their windows. Um, so which is, it's really, really interesting, a positive program in, in, in a community and everybody loves them. Um, and also the uh, Bruderham School, Tiger Garden is also, um, uh, the plants were donated by a, a local greenhouse. And, um, and then it was uh, planted and maintained by the, the students and the parents and the, the, uh, uh, the parent council. So which is, which is very interesting. They make, everybody feels involved and everybody wants to make it better. And this is what community is all about. Um, with uh, community support, uh, financial or in kind, or participation by the municipality, businesses, uh, and institutions for community floor display activities. So here you see uh, this park is uh, uh, by the local Rotary Club, and uh, 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 this one is in Shadiak in uh, New Brunswick. Um, and, uh, oops, sorry, keep my fingers keep slipping. Um, so there are uh, some of these are uh, managed by a local uh, horticultural society and the Berry Garden Club and this is in their in the library and also uh, community gardens and this uh, this also it, it, it is also in Shadiak and it has many plots of um, uh, land for people to grow their vegetables uh, and uh, this has they have over 50 uh, business and private um, uh, sponsors to make this uh, project uh, possible so uh, from the water tank to uh, piping it in to mulch uh, to the wood that's needed um, and uh, and it, it's it's all by uh, supported by local businesses which is, which is growing and growing. And of course the municipality is very supportive as well. So I just wanted 
touch base on some of the floral displays uh, uh, principles, the design principles that, that, that um, I, I use. Um, um, and, and this is a pretty popular concept. So with uh, planters and you wanna do frillers, uh, fillers and uh, spillers. So you have something and like an accent plant of it in the middle, and then you have something to fill in the, the middle part and and depend and, and also some of this filler, which is trailing plants. So depending on the size of your pot or are you doing a combination of pots, um, sometimes we know that there are site res uh, restrictions or uh, financial restrictions. What can we do? to make it look nice without spending a lot of money. Really, for pro display, you don't really have to spend a lot of money to make it look nice, which is which is a good activity for everyone. Um, for hanging baskets, it's also, you would have, um, it depending on the shape. So I have this uh, picture here, there is like a ball shape, you would use a different type of basket. Um, but um, in general, like you can have filler, uh, trailer, filler, and accent plants. Um, and in here, um, you can also uh, have, um, for me, for, for my suggestion, I would say uh, use uh, uh, planter, um, hanging baskets with a reservoir, so which is like a self-watering um a planter uh, a hanging basket so you wouldn't have to go out and to water them like every day and and also look at the soil uh, compound inside and you wanted to use uh, the a mix of soil that is not very drying or promote too much drainage so that you don't um you you ended up drying up in the sun and uh, with planting that design and you wanted to have a plan ahead of time um, or, you know, or talk with your teammates and, and um, you know, and then we need to know what kind of plant you're planting because a lot of these plants are donated by local residents and we wanted to know, you know, what as, men, as much information as possible that you can get and then you know the height of the different plants in mature size and then you plan accordingly. Um, so here are some of the examples. Um, so the one on the left is more traditional, like a stepping type of landscape uh, of um, a floral planting uh, flower beds. And on the right side is more like a whimsical type of planting, um, uh, mixed planting, mixed height, mixed texture, mixed colors. This is the one on the upper right hand corner is our silver garden for the 25th anniversary of the Communities in Bloom garden that we planted in, um, in Ottawa. Um, it's about 450 square meters. So it, this is the, the, the silver garden. Um, and then um, at the bottom, uh, it's like the mosaic planting, but it's kind of like a more, it looks like it's very whimsical, but it actually spent, I, I probably spent three to four years trying to figure out a perfect plant for this. There's about 12 different plants in this planting bed. And they are all relatively the same height, and uh, and they're not all out compete each other. So which is, uh, which is an, an interesting project, and and uh, more design ideas. And um, so I, I always like to mix vegetables in uh, in my design. Uh, the one on the left is actually our. Oh, sorry. Back. Uh, the one on the left is uh, our prime minister's. Prime Minister's office. Um, I planted broccolis and and um, this one is called a green green ball and um, and cigar plants um, and uh, it, it, it's an interesting um, materials. Um, so other than I love begonias, impatiens, and petunias, but uh, they could be very. Uh, they would try and true plants, but uh, sometimes uh, you can mix in other stuff that you 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 like. And on the right side, it's um, a mullet, um, and uh, it's a different color theme. So this uh, this is a new cinnamon petunia, and it's just a mix of the color and um, and so also depending on the size of the planter. This is four planters put together. And just some idea on the left, uh, there is very colorful, but these, these that on the left, uh, there's no one single flower, it's all foliage. 
Uh, so which also uh, is, is a good idea, an area that um, is less um, maintenance and it's just, just pretty much just water. There's no dad heading or anything. Um, and it stays uh, nice. Uh, this one of my favorite colors is called red hat. Um, on the right, uh, you see this is um, a Brussels, Brussels sprouts. <laughs> it's mixed with salvia. So, it, it, and then at the back is uh, the uh, red kale. Um, it's in one of the parks and uh, it's a planting bed. So it's, it's just to share the idea to use different type of materials and make it interesting. Not necessarily more expensive because these vegetables are, you can pretty much seed it in, in at home or, um, or even in a, a small greenhouse um, or purchase them. And so a lot of tips for success, um, it's um, having the proper tools. Um, we're gonna talk more about that next week. Uh, you know, uh, my, you know uh, what is a good weeding tool, for example, or, or edging tools. Um, and for a uh, good source of soil, and you need to know uh, what type of soil that you're using. So, um, so it would actually help um, you plan around with the watering schedule and all that. Uh, um, a good source of plant materials, um, whether they are purchased or, or, um, or there are local uh, youth group that we're planting uh, in, a, in a greenhouse or a local greenhouse business. And, and we know that the different community, different size of community, they have different resources. Um, so it's, it's really depending on the individual community. Um, choose the right plant for the right spot. This is very important. Um, we always have to look at the tag to see if this is a sunny plant that you put in a sunny location. Otherwise, they would just fry in, in, in the sun. Um, and also, uh, I wanted to talk about wildflowers, and we're going to talk more next week. Uh, wildflower, and depending on where the source of the wildflower, make sure when you plant a wildflower mix, and it is a local wildflowers, and not from another province, because one is a wildflower or native to one province may become an invasive species in another. So we need to look at the, the list of what is in the mix, and then decide what to plan. Um, and then a plan ahead with your team. So everyone's on the same page and, um, and weed control and watering schedule that everyone's agree on. And, and then um, and, uh, enjoy gar your garden therapy and then, then celebrate the result of your hard work. Thank you. That would be the end of my presentation. Tina, thank you so much for all those uh, wonderful inspirational photos and your guidance on that. Um, as we're almost out of time today, I would like Dave to put up our sponsor list. And uh, I'd respond to one previous question or comment. And this came from uh, Dr. Andrea Bashi uh, coming from Europe. And what they're finding in Europe, she's telling us in tourist towns, the returning tourists who bring a large part of that town's income uh, are demanding perennials due to their decorative values and colors and their attempts to change to annuals, uh, but municipalities had to return to perennials uh, based on requests from their visitors. So that does tie into a couple of questions from Ruth Ann uh, Ruddock from Indian Head, Saskatchewan, had some similar questions. And Ruth Ann, we will return to your questions and respond to you by email. Um, but today, uh, again, I'd like to thank Tina and Bob for their time and helping us work through uh, some of your questions and answers. I'd like to thank our sponsors as they're now up on the screen for all the work they've done and support for our programs and the support uh, you as the communities have given to us. Next week, uh, we have uh, on Thursday, July 30th at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, uh, we're gonna host our next webinar on outstanding community examples and best practices for floral and landscape displays, um, expanding on today's discussion. So if you can save the dates, uh, we also have August 3rd, uh, sorry, Thursday, August 20th and August 28th, which will be some discussions on urban forestry, environmental action. Um, other questions that may have come in today that we didn't quite get through, we'll certainly try and circle back and uh, see if we can put them into our next rounds of comments and discussions. But uh, again, Tina, Bob, your insight has been very valuable to us. And we certainly look forward to uh, having some further discussions with you.
thank you everyone. I hope you have a wonderful day and continue to enjoy our time in the gardens this year. Thank you.